Hey guys, welcome to the next lesson. Today we're going to be talking about significance tests for the difference in two population means, mu1 minus mu2. Okay, so we're going to say this. If we're testing against a certain null hypothesis where mu1 minus mu2 is equal to some hypothesized value, then the t-test statistic, as always, is going to be this, the statistic minus the parameter over the standard error of the statistic. Remember, we would use the standard deviation of the statistic here if we could get it. We usually can't get it because in this case, with the two populations, we almost certainly do not know the standard deviations of either one of those populations. That's why we have to go to a t-test statistic, and that's why we use a standard error instead of the actual standard deviation of our statistic. And our statistic here that estimates that, mu1 minus mu2, of course, is x bar 1 minus x bar 2. So what is the formula going to look like for real for our t-test statistic? So here we go. Our t-test statistic will be equal to the statistic that estimates that, which of course is our x bar 1 minus x bar 2, whatever that value is, minus the parameter, in other words, the hypothesized parameter if the null hypothesis was true. So we'll just call that mu1 minus mu2 naught, right? The hypothesized difference so is our hypothesized value divided by the standard error of the statistic. So the standard error of our sampling distribution, again, we can't get the standard deviation of the sampling distribution because we don't know those two separate population standard deviations. So we estimate them using the standard deviations of the sample, S1 and S2. We're going to square S1 divided by M1 plus we're going to take the standard deviation of our sample in sample 2, square that, divide that by N2. And there's your standard error of your statistic. So here's going to be our formula for calculating our t-test statistic when we do our significance tests. Okay, good news about the conditions for the significance test for the difference in two means. Uh, they're exactly the same as they were for the confidence interval for, due to, to, uh, for the difference in two population means. So the conditions are exactly the same as the confidence interval. mu1 minus mu2. So that's good news, right? There's no difference. So you'd have to look back in your notes to see what those are, but they're the same, right? They're the same. Okay, so let's launch in to the following significance test. Okay, so our question is this, is there convincing statistical evidence that the Bucks have a higher scoring average than the Knicks for the season? Now, we have to, when we launch into this question, kind of erase our memories here. I did mention what the true difference was between these two teams. So we want to erase that from our memory. We have no idea what the difference is. We also have to block out of our heads any knowledge we might have about these two teams last season. We might happen to know that the Bucks are much better uh, scoring team than the Knicks were last year. But let's wipe that from our memories as well. So we have no idea. So we're going to do a significance test to see if we have evidence that the Bucks have a higher scoring average for the entire season than the Knicks do, based on those small samples I took the other day. So remember, I took five Bucks games randomly. This was the average of those five games. This was the standard deviation of those five games. The mean of the sample and the standard deviation of the sample. Similarly, I sampled six Knicks games. This was the average of the six Knicks games in my sample. And this was the standard deviation of the six Knicks games in my sample. So I had those two separate samples from two independent populations. But now we're gonna do a significance test to see if based on this, we can see that the average was higher in our sample for the Bucks than it was for our sample for the Knicks by five points. Do we have evidence then based on this that they have a higher scoring average for the season than the Knicks do? So we're doing the significance test, so we're going to do all those steps over there, H, N, C, P, W. So the H step really has three components to it. The hypotheses, of course, uh, but also the defining of the parameters and the stating of the significance level. Okay, so let's get right into it. So we'll say this. We will test the following hypotheses. 
Notice they didn't direct us what significance level to use. If they do, obviously you're going to use that one. So we'll just use the standard alpha equals 0.05. So we will test the following hypotheses at alpha equals 0.05. So it is one component, statement of the significance level. Now let's write the hypotheses. A null hypothesis and our alternative hypothesis. So our null hypothesis here is going to be that the true difference is zero. The alternative is that the difference, oh, let's call this um, mu b, the mean of the bucks, minus the mean of the nicks. So the null hypothesis is going to be mu b minus mu k is equal to zero. The alternative is going to be that this difference is positive. So we're looking for evidence to support the alternative against this null hypothesis. Are we going to have evidence that this is going to be larger than this? In other words, when we subtract them, we get a positive difference. Okay, now we have to define the parameters, so we do that next. And we'll try to define them both at the same time, using that word respectively again. So where mu b and mu k are the mean the mean scoring outputs for the Bucks and the Knicks respectively now this is not good enough for definition of the parameters, right? Because someone could read that and say the mean scoring output for the Bucks and the Knicks. Well, that's a mean for the Bucks, that's a mean for the Knicks. And those are means, but those are means of samples. So we have to make it clear that these are talking about means that are of the entire season. In other words, parameters, right, for the entire population. So the mean scoring outputs for the Bucks and Knicks respectively for the entire season. If you don't write that part, then it's wrong, right? Because someone can interpret that as means of samples. Okay, so we've done the H step. Again, the three components, the significance level, the statement of the hypotheses, the defining of the parameters. Now we're ready to name the test and check the conditions. And then of course, find the p-value and write our conclusion. And that's coming your way next. Okay, continuing on with our significance test. So we're up to the naming of the test. So we write our statement here. By the way, I have some numbers here and some hypotheses for reference. But we write, if conditions are met, we'll do a blank for mu b minus mu k. And of course, here's where we fill in the name of the test. Now, first of all, I do want to remind you of this. A lot of students like this zap tax. It makes the connection between proportions and z and means and t, right? So this kind of is a reminder that when we're doing proportions, we're always going to use z. When we are doing means, we are almost always going to use t, pretty much always going to use t. So, zap tax. So, if you'd like to remember that, that's a useful mnemonic to use, zap tax. So, this is not going to be a z test. We're working with means. This is going to be a t test. And its name is the two sample t test. So, two sample t, not z, t. So, two sample t test. We are working with means here. So if conditions are met, we'll do a two sample t-test for mu b minus mu k. So we write that. And then we check the conditions. However, I mentioned that the conditions are exactly the same as they were for the confidence interval. So what we're going to say here is uh, checked in last lesson. So we don't have to write them all out again. Obviously, if you're doing this for real, you would have to step through all three conditions. But we checked them all in the last lesson. Now we should verbalize what they were, right? Random. And when you say random, you also have to mention with a two sample test like this, that the samples are independent drawn from two independent populations. So we have two um, uh, independent samples from two independent populations and they were both randomly draw, they were both randomly drawn as you saw in the last lesson. So the random checks, 10%, five is less than 10% of 60, less than or equal to 10% of 60, um, this actually should be six here, not five. We said that six Knicks games. And six is less than or equal to 10% of 60, actually equal to it, I guess. 
So that's satisfied. And remember, we check that condition so that we have this pseudo or just about independence. So we can use the standard deviation formula, right? It has nothing to do with the normality of your sampling distribution. But what does is that third condition, the normal slash large sample condition. And the reason we know our sampling distribution will be normal for our X bar B minus X bar Ks, the reason we know that's normal is because both populations we were told were approximately normal. So if you look at all 60 games in the population of the Bucks, that's actually somewhat normally distributed and the same for the 60 Knicks games. If we didn't know that, what would we have to do? Well, in that case, since both samples are less than 30, we'd have to look at two different sample distributions, the sample of the five Bucks games and the six Knicks games, and somehow determine, do we have something that is roughly symmetric without major skew and has no outliers? Although that's really tough to do with sample sizes that small. So thankfully, we don't have to do that because we were told our populations were normal. But if we didn't know that, we'd have to go through that, unless the sample sizes were both greater than 30. In that case, then you don't have to look at the samples at all, because even if the population is tremendously skewed, or both populations are tremendously skewed, even if that's true, it doesn't matter because you're sampling more than 30 in each case, and that's when the central limit theorem kicks in. All right, so hopefully that is making sense to you. All right, so the conditions are checking out here. So now we can go right to the finding of the p-value. So it all begins with that sampling distribution, right? So let's draw it. So we're thinking this is normal. This is our sampling distribution. Of what all of our x bar b minus x bar k's would look like. And this is important if the null hypothesis was true. And remember, the null hypothesis here is that the difference is zero, right? That they're the same. So if the null hypothesis is true, this normal sampling distribution would be centered at zero. Now to fill out the rest of it, we, can, we kind of need the standard deviation of this. We know we can't really get that, but we can get the standard error, right? So the standard error, which we call S of our X bar B minus X bar Ks, is gonna be equal to this square root of SB squared over NB plus SK squared over NK. So we can figure out what this is, the standard error of our X bar B minus X bar K. It's gonna be the square root of, well, the standard error of the, or the standard deviation that is, of the buck sample was 10.52. So we would take that and square it. We would divide by the five bucks games that we sampled. And then plus, for the Knicks, uh, the standard deviation of their six games was 4.96. So 4.9 squared, 4.96 squared, that is over six. That was the sample size for the Knicks. So you put this in the calculator for us and you figure out that the standard error is some number like, I think, uh, 5.122. So double check me on that, make sure that's right. I think it's 5.122. And again, what is that number? Well, that's an estimate for the standard deviation of this curve, right? We can't get the standard deviation of this curve because we don't know the standard deviation of either population, because that's what we really want to put here and here, but these are estimates for the standard deviations of those populations. So this is an estimate for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. It's called the standard error. So I'll just call it 5.1. So if I went one up, we'd be at like 5.1. Two up, I'd be at like 10.2. Uh, two down, or one down, that is negative 5.1. Two down, negative 10.2. Okay. And what this means is, if it's true that the Bucks and Knicks have the same exact mean scoring output for the entire season, for all 60 games for each team, if that's true, every time I sample the way I sampled, we're not going to get a difference of zero. But we'll dance around zero like this, and 95% of my results will be between negative 10.2 and positive 10.2, if I kept sampling in the same way over and over again, finding differences. That's how they would be distributed. So what was the X bar B minus X bar K that we actually found? What was that? Okay, so the X bar B minus X bar K that we actually found 
Well, we actually sampled the one time. That was 113.8 minus 108.8. That was five points. That was the actual difference in our samples. So again, if the true difference was zero, we expect to dance around zero. How often are we gonna be at five or greater? So five is just to the left of this 5.1. So there's our five. And it looks like, yeah, we're gonna get five or greater relatively often, I think, if the true difference in, this teams, in these teams is actually zero. That's our p-value. It looks like it's gonna be a rather high p-value. So let's see if we can get that. But we begin, of course, with our t-test statistic. So if we write down the formula for our t-test statistic, which is equal to our x bar b minus x bar k minus the parameter, so the hypothesized b and b minus mean of k, divided by the standard error. And the standard error, of course, is the big square root of sb squared over nb plus sk squared over nk. Traditionally, on a test or an exam, you would write this formula and then plug in everything, right? However, we already calculated the denominator, right? So I erased the number, but I think I remember it. So t-test, now we plug in. So x bar b minus x bar k. So I guess we would write 113.8 minus 108.8 minus the hypothesized difference according to the null hypothesis, and that's zero. So minus zero over, and then again, on an exam, you would write the square root and all your plugins. We actually calculated what this value was, and I think if memory serves, it was 5.122. So our t-test statistic will be five, minus zero, of course, which is just five, divided by 5.122, and if you do this 5 divided by 5.122, you should get a t-test statistic of about 0.976. And that makes sense, right? Because we're just short of one standard deviation up with our five point difference. So now our p-value, this area right here is what we want to find. But remember that when you standardize, like we're doing here, and you're using a substitution for the true standard deviations with your sample standard deviations. When you standardize, you're going to get what's known as a t distribution. So our t test value is 0.976, so I'll leave that there. What we're looking for then is we have some t distribution. So we think of some sort of t distribution. So a t distribution specifically with degrees of freedom of Four. Remember, we're using the degrees of freedom that is one less than it. Well, the smaller of the two, n one minus one and n two minus one. So it's either five minus one, which is four, or six minus one, which is five. Obviously, four is the smaller one. So that's why we're looking at the degrees of freedom of four here for our t distribution, and we're looking for the area to the right of 0.976. So 0.976 is somewhere here. Remember, the t distribution, just like the z distribution, is centered at zero. So we have 0.976, and our p-value will be this area right here. So that's our p-value. So let's use our calculator and remind ourselves how to find a p-value to the right of 0.976 on a t-distribution with four degrees of freedom. Coming your way next. Okay, so as you might remember, to get this area on a t-distribution, we're gonna use the TCDF button in the calculator. Right, so let's find that. It's in the distributions menu, so second distributions. And then it is choice six, so down here, choice six. We can just enter the number six, I guess. So we have our TCDF. Now our lower bound is gonna be 0.976. Our upper bound is gonna be infinity, basically, right? So we enter in 0.976 for the lower bound. The upper bound is going to be infinity, so we enter in a whole bunch of nines. The number of degrees of freedom we're using here is four. We hit paste, and then we hit enter, and there's our p-value about 0.1922. So that's how we find our p-value using TCDF in the calculator. Okay, so the work that we write when we're calculating the p-value, we used our calculator, of course, to do it. So you could write something like this. You could say the p-value 
is equal to the probability that the x bar b minus x bar k value you get is greater than, or you could say greater than or equal to, doesn't really matter, five, right? That's really what we're finding here. What's the probability of being, probability of being to the right of five on our sampling distribution, right? The probability of being five or greater. Equivalently, we're saying this area here is this area here. We would say the p-value, so the p-value, should be a dash right there, p-value, is going to be equal to the probability that t is greater than or equal to this value here, right, which is 0.976 as we see. And then you should add on to this perhaps that you have a degrees of freedom that you're using, which is 4, right? So the p-value is going to be the probability that t is greater than or equal to 0.976 with 4 degrees of freedom. And then you don't write on the test tcdf, right? You just write this. And then you use tcdf on your calculator to see what that number is. And our p-value, as we saw, turned out to be this, 0.1922. So there's our p-value. And we've done the first four steps. Now, of course, the most important part is writing the conclusion. But before we do, right, I think we know what the conclusion is going to be because we just found the probability of getting a difference of five or higher if, in fact, these teams scored exactly the same way over the season. So if their true mean was zero, is it possible to get five or higher? Yeah, it's possible. It'll happen almost 20% of the time by chance. So since that's the case, we can't say we have evidence here that the Bucks score more on average for the entire season than the Knicks do. Because if, again, if they scored exactly the same, if their true difference was zero, we would get a difference of five or higher relatively often. Okay. So there's our p-value 0.1922. Let's write our conclusion. And of course we begin by saying since our p-value, we compare it to our significance level, which we stated at the beginning was 0.05. Obviously, we're greater than that here. So since our p-value is greater than alpha, so our 0.1922 is greater than 0.05, we don't have enough evidence here, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And say, we do not have convincing evidence. that the Bucks have a higher scoring output or a higher scoring average for the year We'll say scoring average per game for the entire season. We gotta make that clear. We know they scored higher than the Knicks in our samples, but we're really trying to make a call on the entire season here. So we do not have convincing evidence that the Bucks have a higher scoring average per game for the entire season than the Knicks did. So there we have it. We had a difference of five, but you can get five or higher relatively often, almost 20% of the time, even if these teams score exactly the same way over the entire season. Now, of course, I gave the actual difference. We know that the Bucks score more on average for the season than the Knicks do, and if, perhaps if we watch any basketball whatsoever, we'd be aware of that. Um, so how come our test didn't pick up on it? Well, I think our significance test didn't have enough power. Why didn't, have an, why didn't it have enough power? Because our sample sizes were small. So to increase the power of the test, you'd have to take larger sample sizes. Although it's true, that would create a complication for our 10% condition, which simply means that we can't use the formula that we use. So when you see more sophisticated statistics, if you violate the 10% condition, there is a different formula you can use and still do the test. So to increase the power, we'd have to take higher samples than we did. Our samples were simply too small to detect that real difference between these two teams.
Okay, so let's wrap this up with the holy grail. And that, of course, is the p-value interpretation. So we have this number, 0.922. You have to be able to interpret what that number means. So remember, we're running our test under the, under the assumption that these two teams score exactly the same. They have the same exact scoring average for the entire season of 60 games. That's how we're running the test. So we ran the test based on the difference that we found, and we said, well, you know, you could get a difference like that or higher, you know, relatively often, if in fact their means are the same. That's what we're saying here. So if I want to write this p-value interpretation, we can start off by saying something along those lines. So we can say, if the Bucks and Knicks actually have the same, so if this is true, that they have the same scoring average, for the season. If that's true, there's a 19% chance of getting a difference in sample means of five points or higher, but we should give the direction of that subtraction, right? So there's a 90% chance of getting a difference in sample means and here's where we can give that direction of subtraction, x bar b minus x bar k. So a 90% chance of getting a difference in sample means of five or higher. So again, we need that or higher piece, right? We're not figuring out the probability of getting a difference of exactly five. It's the probability of getting a difference of five or higher. So there's a 90% chance of getting a difference in sample means of five or higher, simply by chance. And where is the chance here? Well, the chance is in the actual sampling. So when I was randomly, with the calculator's help, picking five Bucks games and six Knicks games. There's, that's a random process, so there's chance involved in that, right? So it's possible that these two teams score the same, and that random process produced this difference of five simply because it's random, right? So there's your interpretation of the p-value. Again, it has all the key things, right? If the null hypothesis is true, if they actually have the same scoring average, so that part is there, of course, the 90% chance, and this, five or higher. That's the p-value interpretation for our test when we tested, do the Bucks actually score higher than the Knicks over the entire season?